So, so um, and now we're gonna be hearing from a couple of researchers that the labs team has uh, been able to work with during the course of 2017. Um, first, I'd like to um, uh, start off with uh, um, introducing Michael Takeo Magruder, who's a visual artist and researcher. Unfortunately, um, uh, Michael's actually not able to be here in physical form today. Uh, instead, he's going to be here, I guess, not inappropriately in two different digital forms, um, one from our time and one from a, a slightly past time. Um, and uh, uh, he'll, so he'll, he'll, he's prepared a video of his presentation, and then will join us for, uh, uh, via Skype for question and discussion um, afterwards. Um, so his project uh, is called Imaginary Cities, and it considers how large digital repositories of historic cultural materials can be used to create new born digital artworks. And he's taken images and metadata um, from uh, pre 20th century urban maps uh, from the British Library's collections, uh, ones that we shared on, on Flickr Commons, um, and he's transformed them into fictional cityscapes. And I've seen his work now in several settings, um, and I really appreciate the way that he not only realizes his artistic vision in digital form, but also how he gives those uh, physical um, uh, life and embodiment as well. So if we can play the, the video, um, I will step to the side. Hello everyone. I'm really sorry I can't be with you all today, but unfortunately, I'm in this. Uh, basically, uh, two weeks ago, I ruptured my right Achilles tendon. Um, and for those of you who know me, you probably think that I've done it doing something like this. The truth is, it wasn't sword fighting or even my other violent competitive sport that I like. It was badminton, of all things. I'd like to say that lessons have been learned, but seeing as it's the one sort of non-violent sport I do, I'm not really even sure what the lessons are. So anyway, apologies and excuses uh, aside, uh, why don't we get started? First, to tell you a bit about my work in general. For the past 20 years, all of my projects have focused on integrating computational processes and systems such as algorithms, live data, and interactivity into visual arts practice. This, of course, has involved the production of many screen-based online internet artworks and various projects created within shared virtual environments such as Second Life and Open Simulator. But during the whole of this time, one of my primary concerns has been to iterate my creations across different real-world contexts through the use of various forms of emerging digital media, often finding ways of getting the digital artifacts and experiences off the screen and integrating them into physical spaces like the black box or hybrid spaces for performance, blending real and virtual environments and bodies or historic buildings and public architectures some secular, while others being religious, and, of course, the white cube, the traditional and sacrosanct home of visual art. And on a final note, I think of myself less as a traditional maker of things and more as a remixer of digital culture. And within this artistic cultural space, which is often highly collaborative, most of my projects over the past decade have engaged with a wide range of humanities scholars and leading technologists. One recent project, entitled Decoding the Apocalypse, is a perfect example of what can come from these kinds of collaborations, so I'd like to now share a short video about this project. My name is Michael Takeo Magruder. I'm a visual artist and researcher working with many digital technologies, everything from mobile devices, code, virtual worlds, live data. My name is Alfredo Cramerotti, I'm a curator. In this uh, occasion, I'm actually working uh, to support uh, Michael's work. 
this exhibition specifically, it has uh, an interesting mix between very traditional, established, important art forms and uh, sort of a reconstituted and represented uh, with cutting edge technology. I wrote a foreword for the show which talks of my thoughts when I was eight years old growing up in DC and it was of course during the height of the Cold War where revelation and sort of the end of times was of course a common theme because there were points in that early childhood where we were very close to nuclear war. You know, I read Revelations for the first time and I wondered if John the Seer was talking of locust hordes and falling stars because he couldn't describe Apache helicopters and missiles falling from the sky. And when I sort of came to the idea for this sort of deck, I started to sort of wonder, well, my daughter, what, what does she fear? What does she hope? So that's really what I wanted to do with this, this exhibition, so to, to take this really seminal text and, and ask people, okay, in this day, in this time, you know, what are your locusts? What are your falling stars? The Horace's technology installation is the one that I created of my own desire. The other four installations are based on my reactions to and discussions with the research of, of four theologians based at King's College in London. So the main focus of the installation is an actual physical horse skull. Everything else in the room is based off a digitization of that. Once it is in the digital space, then it can be transformed, it can be replicated. You have the light boxes of the zeros and ones, the kind of the digital DNA, if you will. You have the 3D wireframes sort of emerging out of blackness. And then you have the physical manifestation, so the 3D printed objects, which are actually being created there in real time in the gallery. It is about um, questions. It is about actually what we're doing here, where we come from, which is obviously something that art has always done since you know, cave paintings to mm. coding. Apocalypse, even though yes, we see it as destruction, the original context of the word is actually unveiling. And certainly as an artist, that's what I've tried to do. Hopefully that gives you an idea of how my interdisciplinary projects end up as art exhibitions. Which for me is quite important in considering the work I have done with British Library Labs as their artist and researcher in residence. Our collaboration, entitled Imaginary Cities, is a project that explores the British Library's digital collection of historic urban maps and seeks to create provocative fictional cityscapes for the information age. To start things off, here is a video we put together to showcase the work we've done to date. My project with the British Library is called Imaginary Cities. It's an arts project that looks to take information and data from historic urban maps taken from the 18th and 19th century and use those as the exclusive source material to create these fantastical cities and urban scapes for the information age. The outputs that I had proposed for the project were things that would be physical forms. Much digital work remains digital and remains on the screen. And that's something that really doesn't interest me too much these days. For me, as an artist, I think about creating things that can exist in a physical space that are tangible objects. And for me, this was also a nice way to hark back to the history of maps as being these precious, singular items and things. So of course, in terms of looking at what I might produce and what I ended up proposing, it was things like digital prints, 
using laser etching systems, 3D printing systems to create physical things, and then even maybe experimenting with combining technologies, taking, say, the latest generation of digital print systems, but merging those with old technologies and old techniques like gold and silver gilding, bringing the analog and the digital together. In terms of the parts of the project, the outputs that would remain digital, for that line of work, I propose to look at sort of the leading edge of what is possible in terms of consumer, prosumer virtual reality systems. So developing these procedurally created cities that would exist in three dimensions over time, using various games engines, and in terms of the display systems, multi-screen projection and VR headsets like the Oculus Rift. So to take these old plans, these old city maps, and then rework them algorithmically and make them into not just 2D plans, but experiential 3D environments. There were quite a number of challenges that I first had to overcome working with the Flickr 1 million images from Scanbooks collection. The first of which, which was quite significant, was actually identifying the, the assets that I wanted to use, good quality maps, relevant maps, the way that you actually can use Flickr's API to search through the collection, it's not straightforward. But working with Mahendra and his team, we eventually found um, the right methodologies for us to extract these high quality maps of major European and North American cities. And from that, we were able to reduce the 1 million to about 2,000. And at that point, I just did a manual sifting in the end. Over the course of the project, I brought in two collaborators to help me realize some of the work that I needed to do. The first person, he's someone I've worked with many times, David Steele, a software architect and engineer based in the US. With David, I looked to explore this idea of taking the singular curated images from the collection and then transform them in different ways every day. So this idea of taking the singular and creating a, an endless set of iterations of artistic creations based on that single image. And that would change every day according to two variables, the first being the progression of time and the second being the interaction of the public with that image in the collection. Another colleague, Drew Baker, who is based in Australia at present, but he's a leading humanities scholar and researcher that does digital archaeology and virtual reconstructions of heritage sites. And what Drew and I did was take the static 2D plans that David's server application was generating each day and take those 2D assets and extrude them into three dimensions in a real-time virtual game environment. So this idea of taking the map and creating a real city from it. As the project developed, I was approached by Mila Escrova, the director of Gazelli Art House, and invited to showcase the Imaginary City's work. First, I was their resident artist on Gazellio the gallery's online platform for experimental digital art, where I published visual studies and ideas over a month-long period. We then organized a sharing and discussion event at their London Mayfair Gallery and presented the various physical prototypes and virtual experiments to colleagues from across arts, culture, and academia. And now, as we're developing this work, our aspiration is to bring it back to the British Library and hopefully exhibit it here sometime in the near future. So hopefully that's given you a decent overview of the project and what we've looked to do. Now I thought it would be useful to show some of the project's physical prototypes in a bit more detail. So here are some video recordings from our sharing and discussion event that was hosted by Gazelli Art House. So these studies here um, are taken from that, that archive. So the first thing I had to do was actually learn how to data mine the archive because there are a million images. Um, I wanted to get maps out. 
but not only maps, city maps, city maps of a certain size, a certain sort of quality, and so on and so forth, and use that you know, as part of the exploration process. So I've worked with Mahendra, with his colleague Ben, to actually learn how to effectively data mine the image set, which should be easy, but it actually ended up not being so easy. Um, but in the end, we got there, and I then curated a subsection of maps to use. And then I started going through and developing processes of ways to transform these maps. So algorithmically, so not me sitting there making decisions, but actually saying, let's build up an algorithmic process, and let's actually put it through the process and see what happens. So where the first one you'll, you'll see here, we'll say process one. So what that is doing, it's going, the server application is going um, to the map live online and then saving the information and then taking out two samples from that according to a certain set of instructions and compositing those together. So that's process one. From process one, then the next layer actually creates this city plan Mandela out of that. That's process two. And then here, just to show the detail, because even though the maps are, say, maybe three megapixel images, once the process is done with them, they end up being around mm, 32 megapixel images. So they get scaled up, they get transformed. At a distance, they look very analog. But when you get closer, they start to look more and more digital. So again, that's kind of one thing that I've wanted to play with. Another thing to point out on these, for anyone that has a smartphone, in my signature here, below my signature, where you actually have some metadata that's just like when I printed the study, um, you know, what the city was, so on and so forth, but you actually will have a QR code, which, if we scan that, and then we go, and that actually takes you back to the original map, live from the collection on Flickr. So this idea, because one of the things that, again, you know, I don't want to have a ream of text by the artwork, but for me, the, 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 the research, the connection to the historical material, to the, you know, to the work that the BL has done to lead up to this, those kind of cultural assets are very important because without them, the work doesn't exist. So how can I explicitly start linking that into the work? So this idea of using you know, something that everyone has access to because everyone has a smartphone. So the physical artifacts that these come from, the, the, the actual books, they are static, absolutely analog, like I said, physical things, um, which I love. But this idea, if I'm then producing a physical thing from a physical thing, yes, it's, you know, it's through a digital process, but can I actually come up with a way to make it live in some way, you know, to take that sort of, um, uh, use the idea of the iteration. And such. So these processes, the other thing to say is that all this, all the processing is being done online through a server application that I'm uh, working on with, well, I'm a, I, I conceptually designed it. My colleague and friend David Steele, who's a, a software architect in the US, he's the one doing the sort of the coding and the heavy lifting. Um, and what we've designed is a system that basically it's a, it's, a, it's a Java application plus a database. So it goes and captures, I say, okay, I want to curate this particular image from the archive. So in this case, the London map, <coughs> um, the specific London map. So the, the application goes and it captures that and saves that image because that image never changes. Um, but then I wanted to, in a sense, create a new manifestation of that reimagined city plan every day, one a day, um, that would just run forever. Now, I thought, okay, well, I always want to have change every day, um, but I also want sort of to reflect how the digital archive itself is always in flux and unstable because it has metadata tags, it has user you know, views, different kind of counters like that, that those are changing in, in sort of the rich information um, sort of cultural material, if you will, the scholarship and knowledge that surrounds that asset is always growing. So how can I reflect that? So we take the sampled area 
And basically what we do is the, the, the two areas that are getting sampled sort of slightly shift over time, just as time progresses. But then you get different transformation values when, say, the metadata changes or the, the view count. So all of a sudden you can have a very slow change and then you have a sequence of different changes. And when I say changes, it's like not only sample area, but we play with the histogram, we play with like how the, the, the different sort of source samples are being recombined to make the final composite texture, which then gets transformed to the Mandela. We've got, um, this is one of our tests. So this is a live test, all it's been processed. So this is day one, and this is day seven. Now they're very similar. But if you start looking at certain things, you can actually say, yeah, they're definitely, but, but the changes are small, because this is just a week. So this is with no metadata changes. No, we just wanted to start sampling like this idea of rate change over time. So between day one, day seven, you get minor, but certainly noticeable changes. And if you see it in an animation, it becomes very kind of obvious. But by day 32, it's very different sort of moved on. But you do still have aesthetic similarities. And then as you sort of shift on, this is day 366, so you know, the first day to the simulated new year, we're again, you know, a very different thing. So this idea of every day the new piece is sort of formed and sort of continuously sort of changing. Thinking about maps and the histories of maps, that maps used to be, you know, very precious. And indeed, I was talking about one of the things I learned from the curators, um, the map curators at the BL, was that the guidebook maps that I was actually using as my source material were not, were of course based off of grandiose, really kind of specialized maps that, you know, people would pay to have access to. And then they, you know, in the guidebook, it would be the little kind of sketch, if you will, that was for print of this, like, really beautiful, expensive map. So I, I wanted to get back to that idea of the singular and the precious and materiality. So I thought, okay, well, maps, printing, what about gilding? So I didn't know how to gild, so I decided to teach myself how to do traditional gold, metal, leaf gilding and such. And these are the results. So what I wanted to do was to, to take those digitally process images to take one of them, and then to basically take the finest materials you could have actually have. So this, from a material standpoint, all the board is 100% cotton, like pigment-based, museum, you know, basically the best sort of cotton sheet, thick sheet board you can get. On top of that, I, I basically then had to modify the historic process of gold gilding, so I started with the kind of the historic, because it's, you know, it's, you know, millennia old, the process of gilding. So I learned the traditional way to do gilding, but then I had to adapt it, because to take the digital image, um, what I've used is a process that's a digital direct-to-media process using the latest gen um, of, it's a, it's a Swiss uh, half a million pound machine, which I actually happen to know for that has one and they like my work. Um, so I, I basically spent uh, a few afternoon with the director's sons who actually love the machine and we sort of doing experiments to figure out how we could actually get these ultra high resolution um, digital images to permanently print onto, in this case, this is solid gold and this is solid silver and such and then thinking about sort of the whole way to frame them, present them, so on and so forth. So this is taking one of those images, it's pointed in, and as you see it fading in, what's actually happening is that the Unity 3D engine is basically creating a new bitmap which is being actually read from that, that live image. Values are being read. Now you see this here, now this, this is a technical study Aesthetics were not what we were looking to do on this. So now that image is then broken up into a subgrid where the pixels from that image, which of course are changing each day, are getting read at runtime. Okay? And this, on a dedicated sort of 400 pound graphics card, it flies through and looks really great. This is running off my laptop. Um, 
So there, we'll let it sort of finish its thing. So now it's basically done a procedural generation of geometry that's based off that image, which you can kind of still see the characteristics of the image there remaining. And then as we go in, we actually find ourselves in a real-time 3D environment. Uh, but basically what it is, it's all of a sudden that resource has become this real-time virtual world, a virtual city that's based off of the process, but then before the process is actually based off that old map. So truly creating an imaginary city from a city that was recorded in, in historic times. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. But before I go, I just wanted to thank a few people. First of all, Mahendra Mahe. Mahendra, you've been there every step of the way with me to realize this project, and I can't imagine having been able to do it without you. Uh, also, Mila Skrova, the director of Gazelli Art House. She was so generous to allow us to come and use her space and, and share and showcase the work um, and sort of talk about ways we could take it forward. And finally, uh, Adam Farquhar and Jamie Andrews, uh, head of culture and learning here at the BL. And with Adam and Jamie, Mahendra and I have been sort of looking to develop things for the next phase of the project, looking to take what we've done here, build on it, and hopefully turn it into an exciting exhibition. So, uh, thanks to you all. And now I'll hand back to colleagues there who I think have an exciting announcement to share with you all. Hi, um, I used to work in news and I've noticed over the past six years, obviously data visualization has become a big trend um, in terms of digital storytelling. I'm curious, how do you imagine uh, so a lot of news outlets are starting to or incorporate VR in some of their stories and I'm curious, how do you imagine 3D or virtual reality data visualizations working? Um, well, thanks for your question. I, I, I've actually, um, probably for the last 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I, I started using a lot of sort of news media sources in my work as kind of a commentary. I, I always saw sort of news and this increasing uh, sort of real time production of news is, is quite a, a rich uh, vein to explore from an artistic sort of cultural standpoint. Um, and yes, as you say, now VR has become a, a hot topic, um, both in the kind of consumer, prosumer space and media production space. And that's another thing that I've worked in for about 25 years. So this is not kind of a new area, but it's something that people have, have picked up on. I, I think one of the big problems right now with visualization, uh, data visualization in VR is that a lot of people are producing, say, really beautiful kind of um, gimmicky things. But, uh, you know, there isn't a lot of really provocative content now that sort of, if you want to look at it from, say, a more commercial aspect, you know, the killer application that is a kind of experience that you just can't have in physical reality that it's, it's sort of a born virtual experience. Um, I mean, I remember last year I was doing one of the keynotes at the VR UK conference, and a lot of the demos there um, were all about sort of these, these recordings of real life. I mean, one, for example, that kind of sticks out was um, a, a driving simulator where, well, it was, it was just kind of recording of you know, a physical recording for made for Oculus of people sort of driving down the sort of, uh, you know, Monaco coastline, you know, winding through the, the, the mountain ranges and, and things like that. And the, the, the person sort of running it is, do you want to try this? And I said, you know, absolutely not. And he said, why? I said, because if I want to have this kind of experience, I'm going to go to visit one of my friends in the U.S. who has a Porsche convertible and we're going to actually go out for a real drive. Um, and I think what we need to do, certainly uh, from, from myself as an artist and, and also academics, is sort of look at when these new technologies emerge, we need to look at sort of the things that, you know, it's not kind of just a, a simulated, you know, poor bastardized replication of something we can do already better in an analog process or experience, but we have to sort of 
step to the side and say, okay, well, what haven't when we been able to do before? And let's try to create sort of a new area of research or a new area of sort of artistic experience that is purposely built for these emerging technologies. Um, and if we don't do that, all these great infrastructures are just going to fall by the wayside. I mean, with VR, uh, shared virtual environments, you know, uh, over the last 30 years, people in the field, you know, you, you see you see the rise of the potential and then you have a new platform develop and then it just if you don't get that kind of killer application, killer experience, the, the infrastructure just can't be supported and it dies off and then you're kind of sort of back to square one again. So, I mean, with relation to these things like VR, you know, the, the possibilities are really immense, but I just hope that we can, um, as artists, academics, we can, um, we can kind of help guide the use and, and push it towards innovation and just not simple replication. I'm really fascinated by what you're doing. I was recently in Barcelona and saw a Gaudi exhibition that showed uh, a church that Gaudi hadn't built. And you were able to see that in virtual reality. Mm. Um, I, in my imagination, when I saw what you were doing, I thought we were going to see an aspect of virtual reality as well of some of your maps, because I can see that's possible. Um, I don't know if I'm thinking ahead. Um, but the applications for what you're doing are amazing. Um, I don't know how excited people are in, in this room, but um, the possibilities, especially with museums, is, is uh, incredible. Thank you. Well, thanks for your, um, your, your, your thoughts. Um, and yes, absolutely. Uh, this first phase, this last year of the research we've done has really been about building the kind of creative technical infrastructures that we need to kind of then push it forward to a full on sort of set of artworks experiences and hopefully a, a major exhibition, um, which is kind of why I also opened the presentation with the um, showing some kind of background of my work and also the decoding the apocalypse because that again was like a four-year project working with theologians from king's college london and um you know like with this we're, we're just in very early stages but that's kind of where i hope to get to so you're absolutely right in in my mind um say let's take in the imaginary cities work the work i've done with um the technologist drew baker uh, taking the, the assets, those sort of real-time generated once-a-day assets from David Steele's server application and bringing those in sort of in, in this kind of connected network, you know, drawing those into the games engine. And as you saw from the, the, the technical studies, we, we take that and we resolve a, an actual 3D environment that is interactive, that can be sort of, that can change over time in a non-deterministic way that people can actually move through and experience. Um, we are prototyping things on VR headsets, uh, Oculus Rift, and also building things where we, what we do is we kind of build these hybrid caves. So you might have like say a three screen surround where you have um, the external viewpoint um, sort of point of view where you actually are, are surrounded by the city but then once you put on the headset, that actually gives you the first person viewpoint as you're then sort of going through. So this, this idea of multiple perspectives um, of this aesthetic environment. Um, I, I, I like your sort of bringing up of, of, of Gaudi because I'm a, I'm a big fan, even though uh, I have no sort of formal training in architecture. Um, but yes, his concepts are wonderful, his aesthetics and, and the way he thinks about space are, are, are wonderful. And, you know, certainly, uh, I, when we're developing the final works, we are going to sort of draw into the disciplines of, of architecture, not, you know, not only myself as sort of contemporary visual data-based art, but we'll, we'll be looking to, to, to collaborate with other various uh, disciplines to create the final works. Well, for joining us uh, um, in this way, that's worked out pretty well. And uh, thanks for the AV folks for doing a great job of um, making the connection not be one we had to faff around to, um, to make work. <laughs> thanks so much for that. All right, so uh, th thanks so much, Michael.